time. Right? We live in a day where we are all concerned and, and aware of and focused on time. I mean, think about this, okay? You get up in the morning at a certain time. You go to work at a certain time. You have lunch at a certain time. You come home at a certain time. Or if you're working from home, you go maybe from one room to the other. Uh, but there's a transition that happens. And then you have dinner at a certain time. You go to bed at a certain time. And then what do you do? You wake up the next day and you do it all over again. Right? There, there, there is just a, an awareness of time. Uh, you know, we, we, we all have likely some kind of device, right? You probably have a smartphone and it keeps the time for you. And because it's smart, it allows you to be able to schedule appointments and put them on your calendar at a certain time. And if you're like me, you're probably, you know, looking every once in a while at your phone to see what time it is. And most likely you're probably also kind of looking and going, okay, what's next on the schedule? What's, what time is about to happen? I know what time it, it is. I'm looking to what time it's going to be. We're very keenly aware of what time it is, and we live according to the time we find ourselves in. And the Bible says that there is a time for everything, that there is a time to be born and a time to die, a time to build as well as a time to tear down, a time to weep, a time to celebrate, a time to keep, a time to give away, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to hate and a time to love. There's a time for war, there's a time for peace, that there is a season and a time for everything under the sun. For this reason, it's very important that we know what time it is. So, what time is it? Let's look at Romans 13, starting with verse 11. Look what Paul says. He says, besides this, you know the time that the hours come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Right? He's saying, you know the time. He, he's implying that. He's saying, know the time. What time is it? You know, some people right now would be saying, okay, I know what time it is. It's time for a political change. That's what time it is. Right? Some, some people are going to be saying, okay, no, no, no. I know what time it is. It's time for a vaccine for COVID. That's what time it is. Others might be saying, no, 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 I know what time it is. Uh, we, it's time for, you know, uh, some kind of like uh, solution to the economic crisis that we find ourselves in. That's what time it is. Others are just saying, no, man, it's just time for 2020 to be over. That's what time it is. Right? Amen? And yet, some people, when they think about the time, it's very, it's very personal. They say, no, no, it's time for my marriage to get better. It's, it's time for me to forgive my dad. It's, it's time for, for me to build some friendships. It's, it's time for me to have some hope. What time is it? What time do you find yourself in? You know, it's interesting because there's always a time within the time. And what I mean by that is we find ourselves living in a particular moment of time that's very relevant for us in our story, but we also live in a moment of time within a greater story, a bigger story, the story of God. And the story of God has no beginning and no ending because God is eternal without beginning or ending. And so we find ourselves in this, this amazing, wonderful, remarkable story. And yet what Paul is saying is you need to know the time it is within the story you're a part of. You know, when Paul says know the time, he's saying, do you understand what time it is within the story of God that you're participating now, as I mentioned, the story of God has no beginning because God is eternal without beginning. But when we think about our place in the story of God, we typically perceive it in relation to ourselves. And so we think of the story of God typically as having parts to it. 
right, that having parts to it, because that's how we find ourselves in the story. And so when we look through scripture, we could say, yeah, the story of God doesn't have a beginning, but it is working towards a certain end. Not that it ends, but it's got an outcome in, in, that it's, it's working towards. And we typically think of the story of God having kind of like four parts to it, right? And the first part of the story of God is what we would call creation. Creation being the time that God created the universe, that, that in eternity past, before there was time, God existed, and then there was a time where God actually created time and space and the universe and the earth and humanity, that creation happened, and it was a, a point in time. There's another part, though, of God's story that we would, saw, we would think of as the fall. This is a time when humanity rebelled against God and sinned against God and fell from grace, where our relationship with God was disrupted. And there's another part of God's story that we would call redemption. This is the time of God leaving heaven and coming to earth to live among us as one of us, to, to, to do a work of redemption, to live, die, rise, so that we could go from death to life. Redemption. And then there is kind of a fourth part of God's story that we would call new creation. This is the time when Jesus who right now is enthroned in heaven, will return to earth and make all things new. That there will be new creation. And so when we think about the story of God, we would typically think of it as creation, fall, redemption, new creation. And when Paul says, know the time, he's saying, know where you are in the story. Where do we find ourselves in this story of God? Well, the place that we find ourselves is here. Right? You're here after the death and resurrection of Jesus, but before new creation. That we are living in this, this, this season that we would still call redemption, but we're living kind of between redemption and creation. But we're still in that part that we would call redemption. What's interesting about this, this season of redemption is that the kingdom of God is here on earth... Because the king, the king of kings, Jesus himself, has come to earth. And through his life, death, and resurrection, he inaugurated the kingdom. He began the kingdom of God here on earth. But the kingdom is now and also at the same time not yet. Meaning that it is now here on earth, but not yet fully, completely realized. That there are some aspects of the kingdom of God that just haven't quite yet happened fully. And those things will happen when Jesus returns, when, when he comes back for new creations. The Bible actually tells us that Jesus is going to create a new heavens and a new earth. And that there's going to be the city of God, the new Jerusalem is going to descend from heaven to earth. And from that point on, God will dwell with his people face to face. That that's going to happen. And when that takes place, there will be this fullness, this completedness of the kingdom of God on earth. But it hasn't happened yet. So right now we are in the in-between time. We're in that in-between time. And what we need to understand is that the in-between time is a time of tension. It's a time of tension. And we all feel this. We feel that tension between what we know to be true and the longing we have for what will ultimately be reality in its fullness. We, we have that tension. And in this in-between time, there are lots, lots of different forms of tension. There, there's this tension between the two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. And we're in the midst of that tension. There's tension between the two realms, the, the, the reign of Christ and the reign of Adam. And we're in the middle of that tension. There's tension between, uh, you know, two types of communities, right? The city of God as well as the city of man. And we're in that tension. There's also you know, two ethics. There's goodness and there's evil, and we're in the middle of that tension. There's two perspectives, uh, the, the, the perspective of light and the perspective of darkness, and we're in the midst of that tension. Two desires, desires, desires to, to, for, for, for heavenly things and desires for earthly things, and we're in that tension as well. Two loves, love of God, love of self. There is two kinds of service those who serve God and those who serve the enemy of God. And we're in the middle of this tension, 
right? This, this in-between time, and we feel all kinds of tension. And what that means is this, friends. While we wait, we long, we long for the return of Christ. Right? We're, we're longing for it. And I know you feel it. We feel it right now so much. So much has gone wrong in 2020, and we really feel that that tension, and we really feel that longing. And so what Paul is doing is he's saying, look, the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, right? Look at verse 11 again. When you look at verse 11, he tells us what time it is. He says, look, it's time for you to wake up. That's what he's saying. It's time for you to wake up. You need to wake up to the story of God that you are in. You need to wake up to the kingdom of God that you are invited to be a part of. You need to wake up to the reality of God. He's saying, wake up, wake up, wake up. You know, most likely you have uh, an alarm. You know, I, mean, I don't know very many people who have like actual alarm clocks anymore. Most of us have an alarm on our phone. But you have an alarm, and when your alarm goes off, it makes a certain sound. And, and, and what's interesting is there's different people, you know, choose different sounds. You know, some people, they like that, that sound that's like the terrible, like, honking. They're like, I need a terrible sound, or I won't actually, like, get up and deal with it. Other people are like, no, 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 no. I can't enter into my morning with that sound. Right? I got to have like something that's a little bit more delightful, you know, uh, maybe like a sparkly sound, like doo -doo 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 -doo, or whatever it is, right? We, we, but we choose these sounds that, that we want to kind of start the day with, and there's a, kind of an alarm that's happening. And I want you to kind of imagine what Paul is doing here, because in a way, he's like an alarm that's going off. Right? Imagine if your alarm clock, instead of having a beeping sound or a sparkling sound, imagine if you, you, the sound you heard in the morning every single day was Paul going, wake up, right? Wake up. The hour has come. Wake up. And that's what you heard. Because in essence, he's doing that with these verses and he's calling us to, to, to wake up. And so why should we wake up? Look what he says in kind of the second part of verse 11. In verse 11, he says, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. All right, he's saying, wake up, because salvation is here. Now, what's interesting is when you think about salvation, there's kind of a, you know, a past and a present and kind of a future aspect of salvation. When you think about salvation, in the past, Jesus did a work accomplishing our salvation, his life, death, and resurrection. In the present the Holy Spirit gives faith and applies the salvific work of Jesus to our lives so that we can experience salvation. In the future, Jesus will return and he will make all things new. He'll write what's gone wrong. He'll make all things new. We will receive glorified, resurrected bodies to live with God forever. So there's kind of this past, this present, and this future aspect or reality of salvation. And when Paul here is talking about say, salvation, he, he's talking about a certain, a certain kind of aspect of salvation. He's, he's, he's technically speaking about future salvation. That's what he has in mind. He's saying, you know, this, this future salvation is nearer to us now, right? He's saying the day of the Lord is nearer now. The, the time when Jesus is going to return is nearer now. He's saying it's closer today than it was yesterday, and tomorrow it's going to be even closer still. And so we need to be prepared. We need to be alert. We need to be ready. We need to wake up. We need to wake up. What do we do as we wake up? All right, what do we do? Look at verse 12. Paul tells us, he says, The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. I'm assuming that you have a morning routine. That in the morning you wake up, get out of bed, you've got a, a, you know, a number of things that you probably do, some type of routine that you go through. 
right? For, for some people, you know, they wake up and the first thing they're like, I, I, I need coffee, right? I can't function, I need coffee. Uh, other people, they wake up and they're like, no, no, I got to work out. Like, that's what I got to do. Other people wake up and they're just like, I need to spend some time praying. Uh, that's the first thing I need to do. Uh, sometimes people wake up and they're like, no, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set aside some time. I need time with the Lord. I'm going to just spend some time doing some Bible study, some devotion. Like you have a routine. Even if you say, well, I don't have a routine, that your routine is not having a routine, right? Like you have some type of routine that you go through, something in which you prepare yourself for the day. And it seems to me that verse 12 is really Paul kind of talking to us about how we can prepare ourselves every single day. He's telling us what we can and should and ought to do. He's saying, cast off the works of darkness and put on armor of light. He's using kind of this metaphor of clothing. You know, you wake up in, in, in the morning and um, you take whatever your clothes you were wearing that are dirty clothes off and you put on new clothes. And that's kind of the imagery that he's using here. That's the metaphor that he's using here. And I want you to notice the type of clothing we are to put on. He says, put on the armor of light. If you were to put on, let's say you were to put on some um, you know, maybe some running shoes and some shorts and, and, you know, a hat or something. Like, what are you most likely going to go do? You're probably going to go running, do some kind of athletic activity or something like that. If you were to put on maybe a suit and tie or a really, like, nice kind of formal dress or something like that, what, what are you going to do? You're probably going to go out for a nice dinner or some kind of very formal activity. Maybe you're going to go, like, to a, a wedding reception or something like that. Right? We dress for the occasion. You know, and what Paul is doing here is, is he's, he's telling us how to dress, which tells us what the occasion is. And what does he say? He says, put on some armor. Why do people put on armor? Right? What, what, when you put on armor, what are you getting ready for? What are you preparing yourself to engage in? Right? When you put, in, put on armor, you're getting ready for, for battle, right? for, for war. That's what you're getting ready for. And so what we need to understand is that here, what Paul is doing is he's saying, look, as you get dressed for the day, every single day, you need to be ready for battle. That's what you need to be ready for. You know, as, as, as Christians, we're living in this in-between time, and there's this great spiritual battle happening all around us. Now, our fight is not against people, right? The Bible is very clear. It's, our fight is not against flesh and blood, but rather our fight is against the demonic forces of darkness in the, the, the heavenly realms as well as here on earth, that there's this spiritual fight, this spiritual battle that we are up against. And so we're to put on the full armor of God so that when we're tempted with evil, we can actually stand firm and we can endure and we'll be able to be faithful to God. And so what Paul is doing here is he's saying, have a wartime mentality. Dress for war. Have the mindset of war. Have the attitude of war. Be prepared for war. You are in war. Every day is a battle. Every day is a fight. It's a fight. Right? So how do we fight the good fight? Let's look at verse 13. Verse 13, he says, let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. You know, throughout scripture, you see the, the Bible kind of using uh, this imagery of light and, and dark, and oftentimes it's correlated with night and day. And we see Paul kind of picking up on these things in these verses. And here he's talking to us about the daytime. Oftentimes when, we, when the Bible does this kind of light, darkness, daytime, nighttime type thing, it will, it will kind of speak in such a way to where the nighttime is a time of darkness. That's how it's associated. And in a time of darkness is when people, they give themselves over to wickedness or evil or things like that. 
The scriptures say that, you know, those who love to sin prefer the darkness. It's as though when you're covered up or you're in darkness, there's this feeling of maybe protection or somehow you're able to hide, you know, that you can't see me, you don't know what I'm doing. Now, obviously God sees and knows everything, so that's not actually true, but people who love wickedness, prefer the darkness. And those who love righteousness prefer and want the light because we want the light to expose the darkness. And the scriptures say that Jesus himself is the light and that the light has come into the darkness of this world and the darkness of this world has not overcome the light. That Jesus is the light of God and those who know him do not walk in darkness. That when the light of God shines, it shines in you and then through you, that there is this, this, this work that God does in you, giving you a life of light. In fact, we are called out of darkness into the marvelous light of Christ, which is what Paul is kind of getting at here. It's why he says, you know, walk properly as in the daytime. He's saying, walk as though you're walking in the light of Christ. Now, he's told us that in order for us to do that, we've got to cast off the works of darkness, put on the armor of light. And what we see happening here is now he's going to start to indicate some of the works of darkness or the deeds of darkness that must be cast off. So this is not an all-inclusive list, but it is a list nonetheless, and he kind of gives some categories here, all right? Some things that we are to cast off, some things that we are to fight against, and there are three things that he talks about that we will look at uh, in succession, right? And we would call these kind of maybe the deeds of darkness that must be cast off. Casting these off is how we are to walk properly, and so what's the first thing he says? Number one, here's the first thing that he mentions. Number one, we must fight to cast off sinful social situations, right? Cast off sinful social situations. Paul says, not in orgies and drunkenness. So here, what Paul is imagining, he's imagining a social situation. He's particularly imagining like a, like a party, a drinking party, a party where people are hanging out together and everybody's drinking and people uh, are drinking too much, right? It's not a sin to drink alcohol, but it is a sin to be drunk. And so he's imagining a time when people are drinking too much and people are becoming uh, intoxicated and they're drunk and their drunkenness is leading to other forms of sin. And he's saying you got to fight against those kinds of situations. He's saying, look, you, you, need to, you need to understand that if you are finding yourself in a situation like that and it starts to, to turn dark, that you need to realize this is destructive, this is wrong. And so if you find yourself in that kind of situation, you got to simply say, like, I can't be a part of this. i got to remove myself from this. And then, and then you just say, i got to leave. i got to go somewhere else. I can't be a part of this. Sorry. What else is he telling us to fight against or cast off? Here's the second thing that he mentions. Number two, we must fight to cast off sinful sexuality. Right? Cast off sinful sexuality. Paul says, not in sexual immorality and sensuality. And so here Paul is uh, he's kind of imagining someone giving themselves to a destructive expression of sexuality. And, and I want you to notice that he doesn't give specific examples. He kind of only kind of gives like more like a category. He just says like sexual immorality and sensuality. This is kind of category. He's basically saying like, you know, this is like the junk drawer. It has all kinds of things in it. This includes anything that would, that would be against God's desire and intention and purpose for sexuality. It's like it's in, anything. It could be anything. You know, according to God... Which, which is clear in his scripture, God has designed sex as a good gift 
And he's given it as a good gift to humanity to be enjoyed within a particular context. And that context is monogamous heterosexual marriage. That that's the design of sex, that it's to be enjoyed within that context. And anything outside of that context would be lumped in the category of sexual immorality. Right? So, 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 so God is not against sex. He's against destructive and sinful forms of sexuality. So this could be a lot of things, right? This could be looking at inappropriate images online. This could be hookups. This could be living with someone before marriage. It could be a lot of things. There are a lot of things that this would include. Now, some people will hear what I just said, and they will not like it. They will not like it. And particularly in our culture, we live in a very over-sexualized culture. People are not going to like this. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to be, a, you know, like rubbing up against these teaching in Scripture. And they're going to be like, I don't know if I agree with this. I don't know if I like this. Maybe you're thinking that. But what I want you to understand, what I want you to consider for a moment, is that our culture, our society has gone so far away from what God wants for humanity, so far away from God's intended design for sexuality, so far away that what typically happens is people are very quick to dismiss the teachings of Scripture. People are quick to say, well, I don't agree with that, I don't like that. And then what happens is people, they give themselves over to a destructive and harmful expression of sexuality, and in doing so, they try to justify themselves. They say, well, that's just not how I feel, or that's not how I see it, that's how I'm not, I'm not going to live like that. And then they'll say, I, and then what happens is they judge God, they judge God's word in order to try to justify themselves. So understand, this kind of a teaching is going to be challenging for some of us. It may be challenging for you, and there, there's going to be some resistance in your heart to what Paul is saying because of the influences of culture and society. And Paul is saying, look, you can't give in to these, these, the, the ideology of culture and society when it comes to sexuality because there's a very distorted view of sex and sexual expression our culture has. So you got you to gotta fight against this, right? You're going to have to fight against this. You're going to have to fight to, to cast off the darkness and put on the armor of light. Right? You're going to have to fight to have sexual purity. Right? You're going to have to fight to, to be faithful to God in this area. Now, he's not done, though. There's another kind of another type of uh, darkness that he wants to talk to us about and tell us to fight against. And so here's the third thing that he mentions in regards to us walking properly. Number three, we must fight to cast off sinful relational dynamics. Right? Cast off sinful relational dynamics. Paul says, not in quarreling and jealousy. You know, I, I find it interesting that um, Paul links quarreling and jealousy together. That's interesting. It's also interesting that these things are put in the category of being immoral and sinful. The, the, the Bible says that whoever hates his brother or sister is blinded by the darkness. And they are walking in darkness. And here what, what Paul is doing is he's imagining a situation where people are fighting with each other, right? Now, now, there's a way to have conflict that's healthy. There's also a way to have conflict which is very unhealthy. And so he's imagining a situation where there's unhealthy conflict. That's what he's imagining. A, a way in which people are fighting in such a way to where there's strife and discord that is happening within their relationship. And this, the, the Greek word here, that we translate in English as quarreling, that word, it actually, typically, what it, what it implies is a verbal disagreement in which people are speaking badly of each other, and, and they're speaking harshly to each other, and they end up resenting each other. That, that's what this word is implying. And so when we think about the various ways this could play out, this could play out in a personal conversation you have with someone, um, this could play out in a conversation you have with someone online. We see a lot of this kind of things ha happening right now where people are having not, not you know, 
healthy conflict, but unhealthy conflict where they're fighting, especially we see this online, people fighting over like political ideologies or, you know, their, their ideas or opinions about social situations, like just so much angst and just, you know, it's being expressed in ways that are very unhealthy. And Paul is saying, look, don't participate in those kinds of relational dynamics, Right, like you, you got to be, you got to be under, you know, aware that that's sinful and it's destructive. And so, if, if someone comes at you and they're trying to fight and trying to quarrel and they're trying to cause strife and discord and division, you got to say, no, 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 I can't be a part of that. I don't want to participate in this kind of a dynamic. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with the idea of let's do relationship, but not like this, not like this. Now, let's do this. All right, when we see a verse like verse 13. We have to examine ourselves through verse 13. So let's do that for a moment, okay? I want you to think about thir- verse 13, and I'm going to ask you just a series of questions. I want you to try to examine what's going on with you right now. Right? Ha- has there been any, any ways in which you've been walking in darkness? Has there, has there been any kind of drunkenness in your life? That could include not just abuse of alcohol, but other substances as well. Has there been any kind of sexual immorality in your life? Are there any kinds of sinful relational dynamics that are happening right now in your life? Because if there is some darkness happening, understand, friend, that that God is calling you to cast off the darkness. He's calling you to cast off the darkness so that you can walk in the light. He's inviting you to change, to experience a little glimpse of and that, that future kingdom reality that is here but not yet fully realized. You know, there was a, a young man, and this young man in pretty much most of his adult life, kind of his young adult life, 20s into his early 30s, he was just a, a party animal. I mean, party animal, wild parties, casual hookups. He just lived for the moment, just wanted to party, have a good time. And uh, to a large degree, the reason he did that is because he felt empty on the inside. And he was trying to fill the void with the things of this world. So just lots of parties, going to have a good time. Let's go do something. Come on, let's hang out. But what ended up happening is, as he as he filled, tried to fill himself more and more with, you know, booze or relationships or whatever, he became more and more empty. He became more and more broken. That he actually came to a point of facing the reality of his brokenness. There was actually a day where he was in a, a park, kind of like a garden setting, and he was weeping. Have you ever been in a place like that where things are just so bad you find yourself just, he's just weeping. And he desperately, desperately wanted his life to change. But he did not know what to do. He he didn't know how to, to change. And then suddenly he heard a child singing. And the child was singing, take up and read. Take up and read over and over again. Take up and read. And apparently near him there was a scroll and he picked up the scroll and he opened it up and the scroll was the book of Romans. And when he opened it up and he read the first thing he saw was Romans 13 verses 13 and 14. That was the first thing he saw. And the first thing he read was Paul's words where Paul says, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. Those are the words he read. And immediately his heart was flooded with the light of Christ in that moment. Right? He he realized, like, this is it. This is the moment. If I'm ever going to experience peace, I've got to stop living in and for the darkness. I've got to surrender to God. And indeed, that's what happened. That day he became a Christian. Now, This young man's name was Augustine. That was his name. And 
when he became a Christian, his life radically changed, right? He stopped living for the things of this world. and He started living for the kingdom of God. And he was passionate, passionate about his faith. And uh, eventually, he, you know, he, he, he became a pastor, he became a theologian, he became a philosopher, he became someone who, he was a prolific writer. I mean, he wrote like over, I think it's like over a million words. And his writings have greatly influenced the world. I mean, when we think of Augustine, he's one of the great early church fathers. That's what we think of. And you may not even be aware of this, of how much influence he has had in your life, but Augustine's teachings, his writings, have greatly influenced Western philosophy, as well as the American Western church, the Christian church. And he went from being asleep to waking up, from darkness to light. And it happened when he was looking at the verses that we're looking at today. And so my question is, what about you? Right? Is it time for you to wake up? Is it time for you to go from darkness to light? Right? Maybe you're hearing this message and you're someone like Augustine and you've been living your life trying to fill the void, knowing that it doesn't work, and you come to the end of all that and said, you know what, I need change. I need redemption. I need help. If so, become a Christian. Because it's in that moment of surrendering to God and becoming a Christian that your life changes and you change. Let's look at verse 14. At verse four, in verse 14, Paul says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to gratify its desires. So again, he's using this imagery of putting on, that imagery of kind of clothing. But this time, instead of telling us to put on the armor of light, he's telling us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in a way, what Paul is doing here, he's saying, look, clothe yourself with Christ. And this is interesting because he's not saying clothe yourself with the righteousness of Christ, though if you are a believer, you have actually been covered by the righteousness of Christ. He's not also saying clothe yourself with the mind of Christ, though if you are a believer, you have been given the mind of Christ. What is he doing? He's saying clothe yourself with Christ himself. Right? With Christ himself. Do you clothe yourself with Christ? Do you clothe yourself with Christ every single day? Or do you start your day by clothing yourself with Christ? You know, putting on Christ is about a commitment. That's what it's about. It's about making a commitment to live for Jesus every single day, every moment of the day. That's what it's about. Do you do that? Right? What have you been putting on lately? Right? What have you been putting on lately? This is actually going to be our discipleship question. What have you been putting on lately? I want you to ponder this question. I want you to search your heart. Ask yourself, what have I been putting on lately? Have you been putting on fear? Have you been putting on worry? Have you been putting on anxiety? Or have you been putting on Christ? Have you been putting on anger? Have you been putting on frustration? Or have you been putting on Christ? Have you been putting on criticism and judgment of others? Or have you been putting on Christ? Have you been putting on bitterness, resentment, hard-heartedness, unforgiveness, or have you been putting on Christ? What have you been putting on? You know, you, you may be at a place where you're saying, man, I, I want to put on Christ. I want to put on Christ, but I'm, I'm feeling stuck. Right? Do you feel stuck? I know a lot of us have felt stuck. 
especially recently. Right? If you're feeling stuck and you're saying, I want to put on Christ, but I'm, I'm, I'm stuck. Friend, know this. That just means you need some help. That's what it means. Right? We, we love you. We're for you. We're with you. Right? If, if you're feeling stuck, then let us know. Let's, let's start a conversation. Let's start a dialogue. I, I want to invite you, if you're feeling stuck, to something real practical, real simple, okay? Because I know right now a lot, a lot of people are kind of isolated from other people. And so we'll make, we'll make a way for connection to happen, okay? A simple, easy way for connection to happen. If you're feeling stuck and you'd like to connect, we have pastors and leaders who want to connect with you. So all we would ask is email us, send us an email, info at resurrectionchurch.com, right? Info at resurrectionchurch.com. Send an email. I feel stuck. I need help. Can we talk? Something like that. And we will respond to you. And know this, okay? The email is going to go to a real person who will read it as soon as they get it. And they are going to follow up with you. And if they're not the best person to help you, they will find someone who's a part of the church community to help you and walk with you. But it will be a personal connection that will result in a personal relationship. Now, Let's do this. Let's go. Let's kind of go back into the second part of verse 14. In the second part of verse 14, you can throw up verse 14. It says, make no provisions for the flesh to gratify its desires. Right? So he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then a part of this putting on the Lord Jesus Christ is us making no provision for the flesh. Right? As we put on the, the Lord Jesus Christ, we're to live in such a way to where we're saying no to the flesh and yes to Jesus. And what's interesting is that this, this phrase here, make no provision, what it's really talking about is it is talking about thinking about, planning, scheming, that kind of a thing. It's as though he's saying here, like, look. Don't be thinking about sin. Don't be daydreaming about sin. Don't be fantasizing about sin. Don't be strategic in ways in which you can sin. It's like, don't put effort into that. Don't make a provision for it. Right? Think about this, okay? If you're a Christian, you're a new creation in Christ, which means that your old life, that life of sin, has been put to death at the cross of Jesus. And you've been raised in faith to new life in Jesus. And so to walk in the darkness, it's not, it's not who you are or what you're called to. And so Paul is saying, don't make provision for the flesh. That's not who you are. Right? That's not how you're to live. You see, here's the thing. People don't accidentally fall into sin. Right? It doesn't work that way. It's not like you're like walking down the sidewalk and you just like slip and like, oh, f sin, I fell into sin. It doesn't work that way. Right? It's just not like that. You have, to, you have to choose sin. You have to actually make some kind of provision for it. You, you know, you, you, you've got to somehow say, uh, okay, I think I'm going to kind of walk in that direction. That, that's what you have to do. And whenever someone's life is entangled in sin, they need to realize that before you found yourself all tangled up, there was a, a kind of a progression that happened. There was, you know, uh, uh, compromises that took place. That's what happened. It wasn't like you were walking and accidentally, oops, sin. It was like compromise, 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 compromise that led to sin and more sin and sin and more sin. Right, you don't accidentally become drunk. You, you compromise your character by choosing to drink more than you ought to, taking another drink and another drink and another drink, each drink being a compromise, a way in which you're making provisions for the flesh, and then you find yourself drunk. Or you don't accidentally fall into sexual immorality. Rather, what happens is you compromise your character and you click on something you shouldn't have and then you start to click again and then click again and that's making provisions for the flesh and before you know it you're stuck in bondage 
You don't accidentally uh, fall into some kind of like quarreling and jealousy with someone where there's great strife and discord between you. Rather, you choose to compromise your character. You allow your heart to, to, to become enraged and, and envious, and then you act on that. You make provision for the flesh, and you speak out of that heart. Right? P- people don't accidentally fall in sin. Rather, what happens is that slowly over time, there's one compromise after another compromise after another compromise that leads to more and more and more and more darkness. That's what happens. That's what happens. And so I want to ask you a really personal question. Are there any areas in your life where you've been compromising? Are there any ways in which you've been compromising? Have you been compromising your character in the way that you relate to alcohol? Or, or maybe another substance. What about the way that you relate to food? Have you been compromising there? Have you been compromising your character in the way that you express sexuality? Or, or what about the ways in which you engage online? Any compromises there? Have you been compromising your character in the way that you're relating to other people? What about the ways that you're processing disappointment right now? The way that you're processing discouragement? Are you you processing those things in a way in which you lash out and compromise? Are there any ways in which you've been compromising your faith? Right? If so, I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this in love. God is calling you to cast off the darkness. Right? Putting on the armor of light, putting on Christ, that means repentance, confessing it to God, asking for forgiveness, experiencing change, repentance of the change of mind, change of heart, change of life, knowing that God loves you and has grace for you and he loves you too much to want you to continue in that dark path he wants to expose the darkness because he wants to bring you into the light and by walking in the light you experience the redemption of christ you experience the forgiveness of christ you experience resurrection life which is what god wants for you friend god does not want you to compromise your faith. Instead, God wants you to live by conviction. He wants you to fight the good fight. But in order for that to happen, you've got to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to have a gospel life, which means you cannot do this on your own. You need God to help you. You know, when we think about fighting the good fight, often all we think, all we think, think about is what we fight against. That's typically how we think about it. But, but every, every faithful soldier knows that it's not just about what you fight against. What really matters is what you're fighting for. That's what really matters. Right? I'll give you an example. Let's think about like World War II, okay? What did you see? You see the, the Allied forces and they were fighting against Hitler and the Axis powers. Right? There, there was a very real threat but what were they fighting for? They were fighting for freedom. They were fighting, fighting for equality among humanity. And then there were those times when I'm sure people felt like giving up. And yet, what did they do? They said, we're not going to give up because we know what we're fighting for. We're fighting for freedom. We're fighting for equality. And so their passion, their conviction motivated them to continue to fight and to keep fighting and to endure. Right? In a similar way, we have to have a passion and a conviction to motivate us to fight the spiritual battles that we are in, to fight the good fight. Right? Only when you realize that you are fighting for God's kingdom here on earth will you be motivated enough 
to cast off those deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light, to put on Christ, to wake up every single day and say, today I want to see a taste of heaven on earth and I'm going to help make it happen. Here's the heart of the matter, friends. Because Jesus fights for you, you can fight the good fight. Right? Jesus fights for you. He's always fighting for you. He's contending for you. He is for you, which empowers you to be able to fight the good fight. Right? The good news of the gospel is that Jesus has been fighting the good fight, and he has won. That's the good news. Right? The war is won. The battle's not over, but the war is won. Right? Jesus, he fought. He fought for righteousness by living a perfect, sinless life. The life we should have lived but didn't live. He fought that good fight, and he fought it for us. Jesus fought for reconciliation by going to the cross to suffer and die in our place for our sins. He took condemnation so that we could receive justification and salvation, that we could be made right with God and experience the life of God. Right? He fought for us for those things to happen. Jesus fought for redemption because he rose from the grave conquering sin and death. He has the ability to give us new life, resurrection life. And Jesus is enthroned in glory right now. He has accomplished the work of salvation, but the movement of salvation is not over and it will not be over until he returns and he fulfills all that he has promised and there is a day coming and it is nearer today than it was yesterday there is a day coming where Jesus is going to return and when he returns he's going to finish the fight once and for all it's going to happen my friends and when he returns he will defeat his enemies when he returns he will actually put death to death When he returns, he's going to make all things new. No more sickness. No more suffering. No more sin. That will be a glorious day of victory. Yes? Amen? Right, but the day has not yet happened, which means... We must know what time it is. We must know that the hour is near. But it is time for us to wake up. For us to wake up and know that the day of salvation is upon us. And we need to put on the the, the armor of light. To put on Christ so that we can cast off the darkness. So that we can fight the good fight. So that we can persevere and we can endure. And we can see God's kingdom flourish here on earth. You see, friends, the goal is for us to be faithful. The, 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 the goal is to be faithful, to, to fight every day until the day you die, because ultimately what you're, what you're fighting for is you want to stand before Jesus and see him face to face, and you want to hear him say, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. You fought the good fight. I know it was hard, but you did it. Well done. And then he's going to say, enter into my rest. Enter into my peace. Enter into my eternal love and joy. Know the time. Know what you are fighting for. And fight the good fight. Let's pray. God, we thank you because you are glorious and wonderful and powerful. And so we thank you for fighting for us. We thank you for revealing your glory to us. We thank you for displaying your power and bringing salvation upon us. God, we confess we've been asleep. We confess, God, we we have not been aware of the time we are in. We confess, God, we have been walking in 
deeds of darkness. We confess, God, that we have let our guard down. Forgive us. Empower us. Help us, God. Holy Spirit, help us even now to put on the armor of light. Help us even now to put on Christ. Raise us up in faith. I pray and ask, help us to be a people who understand we are God's people. Help us to be a people who understand we live for God. We contend for God. We exist for God. And help us to glorify you, God. We pray this all in Jesus' good name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bubba, for that encouraging word.